Galileo Interviews podcast. Our guest today is Lewis McCash, Chief Scientific Officer at Sigma Solutions and Chair of the Mathematical and Theoretical Physics Group at the Institute of Physics. Sigma Solutions was built entirely from scratch by Lewis as a business consulting firm that offers distinct ideas and state-of-the-art data analysis to a variety of businesses across multiple industries. The company has a reputation of finding creative approaches to complicated problems and has recently won Most Innovative Business 2022, awarded by Corporate Vision magazine. Lewis himself has been recognised as one of the top 20 most dynamic CEOs in the UK of 2022, and he's still in, only in his 20s. Lewis was initially recognised as a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society in May 2020 for his creative work on advanced modelling and optimization in the energy industry, with a focus on oil and gas. He developed, put into use and implemented technology that revolutionised the trading and efficient distribution of liquefied natural gas by cutting costs by a factor of 10. He has been re-elected as a fellow of the RSS in June 2021, and he has also been an honorary fellow at the University of Leicester from 2019 to 2021. On top of his business exploits, he is now also in a research position at Durham University. Listen to hear more and enjoy. So you're well known for bringing science and business together. How does math and science come into your business endeavours? And also, how has your experience in business affected your approach to science and research the other way around? Sure. So I think that's a really interesting question. I think that what people don't often realise is that something like maths and science is in some ways kind of embedded in the way we live society. And it's kind of there whether you want it to be there or not. So I suppose the first thing to say is that even people that, you know, the very, very famous, um, intelligent, successful businessmen and women out there that actually, for the most part, are probably using some form of maths and science in their business without realising it. So that's probably, I suppose, the first kind of kind of comment to make. But what I certainly would say is that the businesses that I'm involved in so whether that's Sigma Solutions, the consultancy we've got, whether that's in other kind of blue sky research and development technology businesses that I'm involved in, you know, I have a really key focus in making new science, new innovation, new technology and new research part of that business drive, largely because at heart, even though I'm a businessman, I'm I'm a scientist. And so that that that's really, really important to me to kind of make sure that I can add value and drive that forward. So 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 I suppose that's I in some ways engineer the businesses that I get involved in in such a way that there is a scientific aspect to it, or at least not maybe engineer, but I would be less likely to get involved in a business if it were, for example, purely a software development company that didn't have some additional scientific interests. And of course, those scientific interests are broad. So, you know, you have things like uh, climate change, you know, businesses and environmental businesses, which, you know, th there's a lot of science behind that, all the way to looking at new adaptive technologies for heat transfer, thermal fluids, all the way to quantum computing. Um, uh, which in itself is, is is a huge emerging field. So I think that nowadays kind of, a, you know, progressive businesses, new technology businesses, they are quite scientific in nature. Um, certainly machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, well, when you get to the real cutting edge level stuff, what, what you're really doing is, is mathematics largely. So that it might be true that there are, people in a business that use these models and use the software that's that's given to them in order to run data through the models, but the people that are building the models largely are mathematicians. And so even in this kind of statistical analysis framework of predictive modeling that that many people and businesses are, are relying upon nowadays, that they're, they're quite the, you know, their roots are quite actual, actually mathematical and and, and scientific. So, so that's, I suppose, the first part of, of, of your question when, when you ask about, you know, how, how do I make sure that mathematics and science is part of the businesses I'm involved in? I, 
I suppose they're just intrinsic to the business that I conduct rather than the fact that I try to force it upon uh, upon that business. Um, but but interestingly, you, you, the second part to, to the question was about how, how do I think business has influenced my approach to, to, to science? And, and that's a very interesting one because I think that you need to, um, the, the way in which, so one of the things I love about science and research is that it's objective. And, and you know, Richard Feynman, the, the famous Nobel laureate, you know, who, who passed a number of years ago, made a very, very famous speech about theoretical predictions in science and, and experimental results. And he said, it doesn't matter how good your model is, how beautiful your theory is, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's, it's, it's wrong. And so in that sense, you know, that science itself is very objective. It doesn't really care about your feeling towards it. Whereas in a business context, particularly when you're dealing with clients, so I'm, I'm thinking about from a consultative point of view, um, you do, I think, need to slightly modify your approach. And the big thing in, in, in business is called the 80-20 rule. Um, kind of in statistics and decision making science it's it's more commonly known as uh, the Pareto principle which which really says that 80 percent of the results that ought to be obtained in the most optimal way should actually be obtained by 20 percent effort and the remaining 20 percent of results should you know will take a lot lot more right so so the idea is is that you know we can get so far by not putting in lots and lots of money and money and resource, but actually in business, what you often need to ask yourself is, is that point far enough in order for us to answer or solve the problem that we need to solve for the client or in, 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 in the context? So I don't think that business necessarily has, or my approach to business, I don't think has influenced the way in which I do science. In, in, in that sense, but I do think that the environment upon which I'm responsible for providing a scientific result does dictate in some way the uh, threshold upon which that result is tested against. Right, that, if, if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> that was quite a long answer to question. Yeah. It was, it was a big question. Well, a straightforward question, right? But yeah, but, yeah. Um, but 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 yeah. So 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 I certainly think that in in scientific research, mm. um, I'm certainly a lot more rigorous and in depth in in many ways. Um, not because I'm less rigorous in uh, consultancy, mm. but because. In consultancy, often what you find is that if you have a, a, a client that's looking for you to solve the problem, actually the, the cost required for that extra 20% of really in-depth expertise, that to, to get 100% of the problem, that additional 20% might take another three years and might take you know a, a substantial financial cost. Whereas the result they can get after a year with, a much lower financial cost might be 80% of the way there, but it's sufficient for what they require. Right. And that's, and that's reflects in research and, and in terms of just wanting to, wanting to get to the, to the absolute end of the problem. Really? Is that what? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly a lot more rigorous in research from the point of view that, I'm I'm investigating a research problem because I'm really interested in it, right? And I really want to understand what, what what's happening. So, you know, my, my my area of research is kind of mathematical theoretical physics, and you know, in particular, I look at kind of quantum mechanics and kind of open quantum systems and things at very low temperatures, finite temperatures, and the dynamics between various kind of subatomic particles in 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 these regimes. But for me, as a researcher, I'm very, very interested in understanding what's going on and why the dynamics evolve or behave in the way they do. 
Um, to use that as an analogy, if that was a problem in business, the client wouldn't necessarily be interested in why the, the, the dynamics behave in the way they do. They would just rather want to know that this is how the dynamics of the system evolve. Right. So, so, so they, they don't really care. Maybe they don't care why by putting salt on ice in a car park, it will defrost the ice and make it safer for people. But what they do care is, is that if you put the salt on the ice, it will defrost the ice and therefore it will make the, the car park safer for people. And I suppose that's maybe an analogy to draw between the kind of threshold that I described in business versus the scientific threshold that, that one might find in research. So in terms of how you go about finding these problems that you're, well, you touched on it before a little with in terms of how you choose businesses and you mentioned that the fact that they have a, a scientific aspect to it could draw you to the business. But beyond that, what, how do you choose what businesses you go into, what problems you try to solve? And on the flip side, again, with research, how do you choose what research problems you try to solve? Sure. So, so I think in terms of the, I've tried to do this in the order that you asked it and start with the sure, business. I know, I know, I know I'm um, asking some big questions all at once. But, um, I, I might ask you to repeat something in a minute, but, um, <laughs> but so, so, so in terms of businesses, so um, my, my kind of business portfolio is, is largely based uh, as me acting in an address, investor stroke advisory capacity, where I sit on the board of a director as, if you like, the um, scientific stroke, analytical stroke, statistical kind of auditor, for want of a better term. And I'll advise businesses in that capacity sitting on the board um, in terms of, you know, whether or not what they're being told is kind of meritous. So one of the uh, boards I sit on as an advisor is a company called Bankability, and they are really quite pioneering new uh, technology to allow banking to be accessible to everybody, but in particular those with disabilities, both seen and unseen disabilities. And one of the technologies that they want to develop is to be able to identify based on for example a person the way in which a person interacts with a device can that can the software determine based on how they interact with the device um whether or not they're likely to be say visually impaired and if they are likely to be visually impaired that software will automatically trigger for example, an increased font size. But that's quite algorithmic based and that's quite data driven and it's quite kind of mathematically technical when you actually get into the building of the algorithms in order to be able to identify these trends. And then once you identify those trends, uh, how you can use the identification of those trends and actually to order to develop a software to you know, pr produce some output for the end user. So there's an example of a company where I sit on the board and I give uh, advice on how we might want to approach that type of problem and also act as in some ways an independent auditor so that when they have their team of mathematicians, data scientists, machine learning people, and they're coming with some proposal, I can say, well, actually this this makes sense or actually we might want to consider a different approach so, so that's kind of one side of the business things and in 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 that sense i because board advisor roles don't take up a lot of my time generally speaking that in terms of choosing them i often say to myself where can i add value and is it actually something that i think is a good thing and, and I do think, for example, accessibility in, in digital banking is a good thing. Um, and, and so that's kind of my motivation for picking that. And then, of course, it has the underlying algorithm and scientific side to it anyway. Second to that, of course, I have my, my consultancy business. And um, 
you know, I sit on the board, I'm CSO there as 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 you mentioned in the, the introduction. Although within that, we're quite fortunate in that we have quite a bold mission statement that we can kind of solve the problems no one else can solve. And so if you want to solve a problem that no one else can solve, come to us. So we're quite fortunate in that we don't really outsource clients. I mean, clients come to us in that sense. Um, and, you know, we, we do a very reasonable job at high client satisfaction. Um, so so I wouldn't say that I go out and actively poach for businesses. Um, I, I, in fact, I don't think I've ever actively gone out and poached a business. I mean, there's been the odd thing that I've seen that I've thought, oh, that's quite interesting. I'd like to know more. And, you know, you try to contact the people and you find out what they're doing and so on and so forth. But I, I don't think there's a, you know, I don't, I don't sit and say, I'm twiddling my thumbs this weekend. Let's get involved in a business and, you know, let's uh, let, let's see what's out there. I think it's a bit more organic than that. And, um, you know, pe people often, I mean, I get I get lots of uh, requests as an investor. You know, can you review the pitch deck? Can you review this? Can you review that? And, you know, the, the, there are some great businesses out there, but, you know, you can't, you can't do everything in all of them, you know, and so you need to be selective on, on, on what, what you do. In terms of the research side, again, that's a that's a really interesting question. How how you choose a kind of research, and I think for me anyway, it's it's interest. I think for most people in research, it's, it's interest. You know, and so as you kind of go through the education progressive system, and you get involved in you know postgraduate work, and you think about a problem and you maybe think well, that's quite interesting or I didn't expect that result or uh, that lecture in my third year undergrad was really interesting I'd like to learn more about that area I think that people come into research more from a point of view of I find that interesting and I want to know more and, and then you get into research and you you do research for a while and you review research papers and you build up an intuition of that field over time and as you build up that intuition you might become aware of a result that doesn't quite align with that intuition and so you investigate it and sometimes you go through a rabbit you go kind of down a rabbit hole but I think for me one of the most exhilarating things about research is that it by definition is invest as an investigation of what is on the boundary between what is and isn't known so I and I, I, I love that I love the unknown I mean I mean I think scientists in general go into scientific research because they're comfortable with not knowing what the answer is. And, and and sometimes in research, there's no way that you could know what the answer could be or might be, or if the answer even exists at all. But the journey to getting that answer, I think is really exciting. And, and, and the way in which people try different uh techniques to try to get to some answer i think is 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 really um what, what kind of really drives the research community forward so again quite a long answer to, to quite a short question i really right? the last bit of that sort of the great exploration into the unknown it's a very deeply human sort of drive it seems i i think it is and and, and you know i so so uh neil degrasse tyson the the uh, astrophysicist in the states he um he was giving a talk or something a few years ago and he was talking about experiments and he was talking about i, I think he was giving the analogy that he'd seen a parent uh give their kid into trouble because the kid jumped in a puddle and it got their jeans wet or something right and you know neil degrasse tyson's made this point of for that child unbeknown to them that was a scientific experiment it was there's a puddle there what happens when i jump in <laughs> yeah so i think you're absolutely right in what you say that i, I mean the, the the human species is a phenomenal kind of subset of of all species that has that inquisition and has that curiosity to 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 the degree that that it does i mean if you look at other animals in the animal kingdom um you you will find uh 
curiosity, you will find inquisition. Um, you know, even even household pets, dogs are a really, really good example of this, right? They sniff everything because they pick up a scent and they're curious and they tug on the lead and they want to find out what's going on. Um, but, um, well, of course, they don't have that to the same cognitive response that a human does to be able to necessarily um, go, go through that, that, that kind of thought process. That being said, even within the animal kingdom, there's a lot of mathematics. Um, so, so symmetry is a huge thing that is uh, in the animal kingdom in terms of fight for flight response. Um, okay. Generally speaking, because uh, animals are symmetric yeah. in, in their fits, which means that if I'm if I'm a if I'm a maybe human is not a good example because we're kind of a higher ordered intelligence being, but if you take something like a a dog. And a dog's in the wood and it sees something from a distance that's symmet that, that has a symmetric face. The dog knows that either that's something that could eat it or it's something that will eat itself, if you know what I mean. So, 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 yeah. right? So, 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 if a dog sees a wolf in the woods, yeah. the dog doesn't necessarily know that it's a wolf, right? In the same way that we know that it's a wolf. Okay. The dog can identify with the symmetry of what they see to know that it's another animal and knowing that it's another animal the dog can then identify the fact that either i can eat that other animal or that other animal will eat me that's amazing that's based off symmetry yeah so so and, and actually in, in, in it and in, in quantum mechanics which it, it, as i said is kind of my main field of interest in many ways um lots of things work based on symmetry. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at uh, gravity is a bit of a different topic, which opens up a can of worms that we won't get too much into. But, um, but if you look at things like the electromagnetic force, the electromagnetic force, um, it, in some ways you could argue is, uh, was kind of theorized based on finding symmetries within some, you know, mathematically ordered groups. So, uh, and then if you look at the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear attractive forces, when you break them down mathematically, the reason that the, 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 the thing that gives rise to the forces from a kind of mathematical construction point of view is symmetry. So actually, when you want to think about how two magnets attract or, you know, how, how there's an electric shock from, you know, a static shock, actually, the, the, the mathematical construct to describe these at a very, very deep level is... Is, is largely to do with things like symmetry and group theory and all these kind of fundamental mathematical structures that people take for granted and yet they're embedded w within nature. That's beautiful. It, it, I, I think it's pretty cool, but then I'm biased because I'm a scientist. Of course. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so I would say it's one cool, of those, those I, I do think it's really cool. Definitely and, one of those people particularly exposed, uh, particularly, um, what's the word for it? Um, to, just set up to kind of explore into that unknown as you said yeah I, I think in some ways what i think is actually quite cool about it is the fact that we take it for granted yeah you, you, you know it's just it's it's almost like it's you, you know people and, and this comes on to you know public understanding of science which we can talk about later if if, if you want but yeah. but you know um people kind of I think just take for granted oh things work just because they work you know or things behave in the way they do just because they behave in the way they do and and I think that for me and again I I, I quote Feynman I mean I, th I, th I think he a huge loss to science but I remember again him him saying in an interview about uh I think it was his cousin or something was talking about you know you abstract everything with maths and physics and I could look at a flower and I could see the beauty in a flower. And Richard Feynman kind of response to this was, but I could also look at a flower and see the beauty in the flower. But I could also look and can in both a anti-clockwise and clockwise direction and realize that if I calculate the number of offset petals in the anti-clockwise direction and then the interdispersed petals in the clockwise direction, I'll get 
two numbers which are adjacent numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. And then I can think about why is it that that flower opens when I, well, you know, when, when, when it, the sunlight comes in and then what's happening with light and well, light's an electromagnetic wave and this causes a chemical reaction within the flower to allow it to be pollinated by the bees. And so, you know, I think Feynman was saying that, yes, I can appreciate the beauty at face value, but I also have that deeper understanding, which is, you know, if, if not more, at least equally beautiful. I'd say it's a higher level of beauty. But well, again, so but, I, but I'm biased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're when you're at that boundary between the known and the unknown, when you're problem solving, and and the same as when you're when someone comes to you and are seeking your advice or consultation in your business, what what's your general approach to to problem solving? How would you go about in general if you're given a problem? How do you solve it? Um. <laughs> Again, a big question. I, I hope you're not going to give me a problem to, to, to solve. Yeah, um, I have a test ready. But... Yeah, it's, it's coming up. It's 20 minutes back. Um, you, you know, that's a really, really good question, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and I think w w w when you study, you know, when you do an undergraduate, a master's, whatever it is, you... you certainly in theoretical science, so mathematics and, 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 and physics, you know, you build up, I think of it a little bit like being be, being a painter and decorator in some ways. And as a painter and decorator, I don't go to, to, to someone's house with one tin of paint and one brush, right? I take a couple of tins of paint. I take some sheets to put down. I take different sizes of brushes. I might take a roll. And that's like my toolkit. And what I think the kind of undergraduate master's training gives students is their own mathematical toolkit. It gives them an auxiliary of tools and techniques, which as they begin to go into or embark on research, they can in some ways use to play about with things. And one of, I think the, the best ways in, in research is to, to just play about with the math, you know, and get familiar with with with, with the math. Um, but in my in my own case, I certainly I, I I'm not someone that can sit at an office desk nine to five and do research and do calculations. Um, I'm definitely someone that, you know, I I'm kind of always thinking about a problem. So when I walk into the office, so I have a about a forty minute walk into the office in the morning, and you know, it, I'm kind of thinking about problems, and I I wouldn't say that I'm doing calculations in my head, but I'm trying to assemble so that when I have pen and paper there, I, I, I can write something down. Um, but but I'm one of these, these people who I spend a lot of time thinking about a problem and trying to kind of work out the problem in my head. And then I'll say, okay, so now I think I know kind of what's going on. I kind of have an idea on how I might want to approach this. Let's try and approach it in that way. Right. Um, there are other people that I know that can sit down at a desk with pen and paper and do maths all day. I, I, I mean, that's that's not me. Um, but but I like to think that the the proportion of the day that I do sit down and do pen and paper maths is solid pen and paper maths in that shorter period of time, right? And in some ways, this comes back to the Pareto principle. You know, in, yeah. in in some obscure things. Yeah. So so when you sit down and with your pen and paper, what could you briefly describe what the research you're doing at the moment entails? Like what what are you trying to find out? So um so I'm working at the moment on so so kind of the, the, the biggest thing I'm working on at the moment is looking at something called a Bose Einstein condensate, which is a very, very cold cold, 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 cold system. And this kind of at zero degrees Kelvin. So, so, so I'm kind of simplifying things a little bit. And, uh, you know, we make some assumptions for the purpose of this explanation. But at absolute zero, um, you have what you might want to think of as a full condensate. So, so you have this full condensate state. But if you gradually increase the temperature to you know, a small amount above zero Kelvin to what, what you then call a finite temperature, 
you can take a you can find a partition within this uh, domain, this this kind of fluid, if you like. You can find a partition where you have a condensate component and a non-condensate component. And there are various approaches to try to describe the dynamics of the system. Um, one of them, interestingly enough, is an approach called the symmetry breaking approach. Um, but but you, when you do that, you run into kind of problems because of the way in which you need to assume that things happen over limits that tend to infinity and you, you, you run into kind of problems with this. There's another approach by 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 uh, people at Durham um, called the numbers conserving approach, and um, this is a kind of alternative regime to to looking at the system in order to describe the dynamics. And what what, what they do is they say, well, let's assume that the the total number or order parameter within the states is is conserved, and let's partition into a condensate and non-condensate and see how these dynamics evolve within the, these two different partitions, which is what, what they've done. And what I'm looking to do is try to... So, so I should say that this considers the whole thing as a closed system. Um, so, so what do I mean by, by a closed system? Well, this assumes that the kind of rise in temperature, if you like, and the Bose-Einstein condensate is all one unit. It's all like within one box, if you like, and we treat it as one entire thing. Well, I'm kind of, so I'm doing two things on this. One is, can we generalize these results to kind of infinitely many modes? So, you know, if you, if you want to get, get things in, in the ground state, a, a subatomic level, you know, subatomic particles in the ground state. You can describe various modes that occupy these different states, and can we be able to generalize this result for kind of n modes or infinitely many modes, if you like? But the second thing that I'm looking at with it is to say, well, rather than treat this as a closed system, can we investigate whether or not you treat this as 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 coupled systems? So you have a kind of closed system describing the general dynamics of the condensate. Then you have an open system uh, called a thermal reservoir, sometimes called a thermal bath in physics. But really what, what this really means is this the equation that describes kind of this change in temperature and the consequences of this change in temperature. Then you couple these two systems together and you look at the interaction caused by the coupling of these two systems. So this is a kind of new approach that I'd I'd like to try, but um, but it's very yeah. Early. It's definitely not paper ready yet. Right. Okay. Um, so, so, so this is kind of what I'm working on at, at, at the moment. That's fascinating. Okay. How long do you think, what, what do you think the time span is from having this idea and looking at, okay, how do I, how do I go about researching this? How do I go about investigating to being able to publish a paper? What, what does that look like generally? So, so, so one thing I should say about publishing papers is publishing papers is good, right? Because in the academic and scientific community, if you have good, you know, well-reviewed papers, well-cited papers, it helps to give kudos. But I'm, I, I mean, I'm not a researcher that's so precious about publishing, albeit that I've published actually a relatively modest amount of papers in the past two, three years. Um, in the sense that I'm, I, I'm more excited by just doing the research. Yeah. And if I can get a good publication out of it, then great. But I'm not doing the research to be able to publish the result. Albeit that I do actually believe that publishing results is is a good thing for the scientific community in order for the community as a whole to know what's going on so that you can advance science. Um, the how long question is a bit like how long is a piece of string. Yes. And, and, and it has to be by definition because we said earlier that research is the investigation of what's on the boundary of what is known and unknown. So, so it's almost built in with the definition of that boundary layer that if you don't know what the answer is or what the answer could be or how you might want to get there, it's by construction almost impossible to say how long 
it takes. That being said, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, I am one of these people that I'd spend a lot of time thinking. I mean, you know, if, if, if I, if you were to take my research time, I probably spend about 70% actually thinking about stuff and 20% of my time actually doing stuff and 10%, you know, the main 10% discussing ideas with colleagues. Um, so, so I spend a lot of time actually really thinking about what's going on and, and, and how to make things work, which I think is advantageous because in some ways when I actually use the 20% to go to do the maths or to go and do the model or to try to solve the equation, I've gone in with some sort of preconceived view as to how I'm going to do it in many ways right. because I've thought about it rather than just approaching it and saying, Look, let's try anything, let's you know, throw mud at the wall and see what, 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 what sticks. Um, which incidentally isn't necessarily a bad approach. You know, I'm not criticizing people that, that, that take that approach. I mean, different strokes for different folks. Um, but I certainly spend a lot of my time just thinking about a problem. Do you think that partly comes, and I know there may be plenty of mathematicians like this, but I know you've had more of a mathematical background. Do you think that partly comes from there in terms of how you consider how you consider a problem, spending that time thinking through something before diving into it? I mean, I, I, I don't know because the problems, that, so, so the problems that I study are actually problems of physics, albeit that I am a mathematician. Yeah. Really, in many ways. Um, and certainly I do notice a difference in styles and rigor and approach and how I, you know, conduct and produce research right. um, relative to other people that I know in physics. I think having come from a mathematical background, I have a wider array of tools to study the particular problem that I want to study than maybe someone that didn't come from a mathematical background. But I don't, I, I, I don't think that makes me any better a researcher. No, I don't, I, I don't, I, I certainly don't think that uh, I'm any better or more, more unique in, in what I produce than, than somebody else who doesn't have a mathematical background. Um, I, I mean, in, 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 in some ways, in, in many ways, the idea is independent to, to the mathematics in, in, in some ways, right? So, so you, could have, you could have a very, very good theoretical physicist that has an excellent idea on how, that only has a background in physics, that has no background in mathematics that has an excellent idea that, that, that works. Mm. It might so be that they collaborate with other physicists and mathematicians in order to demonstrate that idea, but, but, but that, that shouldn't be taken away from them. And I don't think that they're disadvantaged necessarily from having good ideas. I mean, people will have, good researchers will produce good research independent of the background from which they have come because they are good researchers, because they are curious researchers, you know, I think. So I don't think coming from a mathematics approach has prejudiced my ability to yeah. do research. Certainly my research is better than my colleagues. So moving on, and you mentioned before um, the importance of science in society briefly. Could we speak a little more about that? So what do you think is the importance of the public having an understanding of science? Well, I mean, I think this is a two kind of aged for it, right? I mean, there's one side that science is really cool and um you, you know i think everybody does have some sort of appreciation for science even though they might not you know realize it so you think about looking up at the night sky you know it's coming into to autumn and then into winter and you look up at a clear night sky and you see the stars and they're you know millions of light years away some of them and everybody looks up at it in awe and wonder and you you have a conversation with people and you say well yeah but they're not really there and people say, what do you mean they're not really there? I can see them. I say, well, you take a star that's four light years away. That means that that's taken the light four years to reach us, which means that if we're seeing it now, we're actually seeing that star four years in the past. So there's a really interesting perception of how the public, I think, view nature and how the world works against how the world actually does work. And I certainly think that having a bit more of an understanding of kind of the scientific uh, 
description of how the world and how the universe works and the scientific method behind that is is really quite quite, quite useful um 100 and i think it's fulfilling as well you know to, to to have a deeper understanding as to how things work so you many examples so uh banking for example mm. You know, a bit people say, oh, you know, I'll never use maths. It's, it's not important to me. I don't need to know maths. And I say, well, you know, you maybe never will use mathematics. But, you know, do, do you want to empty out all the money you've got in your bank accounts and give it to random people on the street? And they, they think you're crazy. And I say, well, without mathematics, without prime numbers, cryptography and banking security wouldn't work. So all your money would be gone because you would have no banking security. And, and it is, I, I do take the view, I do take the point, sorry, that, um, yes, does the person going to the ATM, putting the card in and putting a four-digit pin need to understand number theory or cryptography? No, they don't. But I do think it's important that they have an appreciation of the fact that it is number theory or cryptography that has been used to ensure their financial security. So to what to what extent do you and I know I know obviously it's a blurred line and it'll be different for different things it's difficult to to put a number on it but to what to what extent do you think the public should have an understanding of of that and just just the extent that they can appreciate sort of the vast knowledge that's been accumulated out there to allow them to to use these sort of technologies or I mean I think I, I of course don't expect the the public to be biologists or chemists or physicists or mathematicians or anything like that but I suppose in the same way that you know in, in the same way that the public have a general understanding of how the political system works how the parliamentary system works in the UK which actually the, the public don't understand very well at a granular level, but they don't need to, right? But what they do need to know is they need to understand sufficient procedural conduct of the British Parliament in order to be able to vote, yeah. in the sense that they need to know how to vote and what they're voting for and what does it mean if there's a hung parliament, what does it mean if someone gets a landslide, what does it... So, and so I think on, on a similar level, people should have an awareness of you know what what's going on in science and and and, and why it's important um I, I do think that's important for society i think you know because because even within society when you look at the the past couple of years the coronavirus pandemic um the, there was this huge thing about vaccines which you know that I, I mean the vaccine rollout was actually even though it got a lot of criticism i mean it, it, i think that it was perhaps overly criticised and people were very, very quick to pick out errors or flaws or things that went wrong. But actually, if you look at the vaccine rollout that we had in the UK, it has been an amazing institutional programme um, and, and it has saved a lot of lives. That being said, pub, the, even now, the, the general public don't actually understand what a vaccine is, right? So, 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 so the general public have this view of, I mean, I am generalizing here, but even now, you know, you speak to some people and they'll say, yeah, but I've been, I've been vaccinated, so I'm not going to get COVID. And a, a vaccine doesn't stop you from getting a disease, right? And this is like drugs that they're putting into their arm, but they've got no understanding. So I'm not saying that they need to be virologists. I'm not saying that they need to know about, you know, RNA capsids and biomarkers and all this kind of stuff. But I think that, people should be aware of, generally speaking, sufficient amount of science to know that a vaccine does not prevent you from getting a disease. If anything, on a very kind of basic level, if anything, what it does is aids to give you a more fighting chance should you contract that disease. It also doesn't stop you from contracting and passing on a disease, which is another huge misconception, right? Because everybody said, oh, well, I'm vaccinated. I can go away and party and we don't need lockdowns or uh, I'm veering into lockdown political conversations which I want to stay away from actually but you know my, my point is that uh, had as a nation or society we have a bit more of a general public understanding of science and topics in science particularly when you have a pandemic uh you, you know in in you know in the, in, in the country and further afield 
I do think people should be aware and educated of the fact that, well, yes, I might be vaccinated, but that does not prevent me from having the disease. It doesn't prevent me carrying the disease and it doesn't prevent me from carrying the disease and passing it on to somebody else. So so where do you think um, the the burden should lie? Do Should all scientists have a duty to communicate some of their work to the public or contribute some of their time to that? Um, or is it more on the public that the information is out there and everyone has a duty to go and find out these things? Um, so certainly if you, if, if you look at academics and, and researchers in academia, um, they'll tell you that they don't have time to do public engagement of science. And to, to be fair to a lot of them, there, there isn't a lot of time. I mean, even research, you know, there's not a lot of time to do research by the time you look at teaching duties and administrative duties and all these other kind of things that, that you're expected to do as an academic in, in an institution. Um, so it is very, very difficult. Um, that being said, I do think there is a responsibility for the scientific community to try to do more public engagement of science. And one of the things that I'm looking to do in the, the, the group I'm involved in at the IOP is public engagement of science. That's one of the things in my manifesto for the next four years is to make it accessible and available. I also think that if, uh, I, I also do think that if it is then made available and accessible, I think the public do need to take some responsibility in actually trying to find out about these things and contributing themselves to these things. And, Largely, academic institutions largely are government funded, one way or another, which means that they're paid for by public tax, largely. So one could take a very facetious view and say, well, on the basis that people's tax contributions are paying for my research, they on that basis alone, have a right to know what I'm doing with my time. Um, so if you wanted to take a kind of political view on it, you could also take the political view. I, I, I don't like, I, I, even though I do believe that the fact that it's come from taxpayer funds, um, the public therefore have a right to know, I actually think in 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 some ways that's, that, that's almost like a, in my view anyway, that's kind of more like a statutory right Whereas I think what I'm advocating for isn't uh, it, it isn't the same as that. I think what I'm advocating for is the kind of willingness and desire for a better public understanding of science, right. which is not the same as having the right to a public understanding of science. You're definitely setting a good example coming on the podcast for one, and also, you know, in your, <laughs> your new position at the IOP, probably more importantly. Um, what are you? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'll have all these Twitter emails coming coming back to me, you know, in a three weeks' time, saying you're meant to be a scientist. Don't say anything political or controversial, <laughs> you know. But um, so, but... what are you in terms of um, increase at your four year program that you said to increase public engagement in science? What 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 sort of things does that involve? I'm here, I'm an I so this is the <laughs> <laughs> no, very start, of course. <laughs> we um so so we well so I've just taken on as chair um at the beginning of October. So you know I'm i I'm just into this four year term. Mm. And um mm. in in that regard, you know, we, we don't have a lot yet that, that that we put forward, but certainly we do want to put on, you know, a, a kind of event. Uh we do want to try to find out in some way from the public, you know, what what is it that you're interested in science and what is it you're not interested in science and why aren't you interested in those things in science? Because I I, I mean, there's there's an interesting synergy between us as scientists and, and the public when you think about science communication in that as a scientist, we're expected to lead. And this comes back to your question earlier about kind of whose responsibility is it to do this? We're expected to lead as scientists, but equally we need to be led. We need the public to tell us, well, actually this is, you know, what, this is why we don't have 
an interest in science. Well, this is why we we don't want to learn about um, you know prime numbers or symmetry or quantum crypt cryptography or whatever it is. So, so I do think there has to be a kind of sym symbiotic relationship there. But I think that by putting on events where people can actually come to and doing those events in a way that is fun and engaging is, is really important. But it's very difficult to try to organize and orchestrate that. I mean, it's very difficult to get the the tone and the note correct. Um, but I, I do think that things like talk shows and podcasts, uh, these kind of things, I think are easier for the public in today's society rather than going to a big hall with lots of stalls and feeling like a career fair, you know? Um, but, so I think the medium upon which we 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 deliver that science is is important. That's interesting. Okay, so the um, the Institute of Physics also has a, a program called Limitless. I know, um, looking at encouraging more young people to get in science. Less, less a public understanding now, but more students coming up into that. What 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 are your thoughts on things that could be done to increase the diversity in in physics? I know that's been a problem in the past. Yeah, I you know I think that so, so in high school. In secondary school, um, and I was speaking to someone about this uh, at the IOP actually on I think it was Friday, Thursday last week, Thursday Friday I can't remember anyway, and we were we were both in agreement that high school students see like not doing well at mathematics in high school is like a badge of honor, right? It's like hey I failed my GCSE <laughs> maths exam look how cool I am, and I think that part of the problem is. I don't think that, and I can only really talk for theoretical science, so mathematics and physics, but I don't think that that, that kind of theoretical science is taught very well in secondary schools, actually. Um, and I, I think that, that that does need to to change in many ways. Um, although I think people are scared of topics like mathematics because they don't understand it. You know, and, and because they see it as abstract. Mm -hmm. So you have something like, you know, two by two simultaneous equations and you have a question in your GCSE paper that says, John bought five apples and six bananas out of Tesco and it cost whatever. And Tracy bought three apples and nine bananas out of Morrison's and it cost whatever. Work at the cost of one apple, one banana, right? Yeah. You know I don't go into Tesco and I don't go into Morrison's and I don't do that calculation, right? Because it's just not practical. You know, but the skills that you're learning in solving those equations are some very, very, very fundamental skills. And I think that the way in which that's communicated in secondary school isn't, isn't correct. Um, and I think that there has to be more application in the examples in high school. So, you know, you do GCSE maths again, you do, you know, uh, rotational symmetry, you know, um, and, and all this kind of thing. But actually, yeah, I think, you know, if, if this was presented in a way where we said, okay, let's look at symmetry in nature. Let's take the whole class and go for a walk for one lesson and let's look at symmetry in nature and let's identify these different patterns in nature and let's talk about them. And let's try and understand what this, this rotational symmetry tells us about something in nature. I think that's a, a, a better way to do it because people are then seeing, they're learning about symmetry, rotational symmetry, for example, but they're also seeing actually, well, this actually is part of my everyday life in some way. Um, I was lecturing uh, last year, a course, and part of the course was uh, calculus, differential equations, and it was to non-mathematicians and, you know, they, they kind of couldn't get it. And I remember I took in tennis balls into the, the lesson uh, w one week and we threw tennis balls about and we took stopwatches and we measured distances and we timed how long it, and in doing that they didn't realize that they were doing mathematics because they were throwing tennis balls about and we were calculating distance and we were calculating time and we were talking about well 
the velocity, the speed is just actually the distance in which this tennis ball goes over the time of which trap. And then you begin to form some intuition of what's happening and you say, but wait a minute, this is just a derivative. So you can take something like F equals MA, you know, kind of Newton's law, and you can express this in terms of whether you can express acceleration in terms of changing of variables relative to time. And you can build up some sort of mathematical model from there. And I think that just the approach of something practical was was really useful for, 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 for the students who weren't coming to study a degree in mathematics, coming to study a degree in computer science, but had to do kind of first year linear algebra and calculus. But I think it was useful for them. That sounds like a fun lesson. <laughs> I would like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I um I, I, yeah. We um we kept the health and safety uh sure. you know, we, we didn't throw anything too too hard or too high. Right. So I know I know we're over an hour now running slightly over time. So um a question uh for your challenge to finish off. If if I hadn't already decided that I wanted to go and do maths and physics at uni, how would you convince me right now to study maths and physics? What what would be what would be your short list of reasons to, to finish on? So I can give you a very, very famous proof, which actually is not anything to do with my research and not really anything to do with an area of research that I have particular interest in, but it's a very short proof and it's very, very um, easy one to go through. And and I'll I'll kind of condense it a little bit. So if you want to look at the proof, you know, it's a bit more explained than this, but it is really to show that, that prime numbers are infinite. And the way you do it is you say, well, every number can be built up by taking products of prime numbers. So you can multiply different prime numbers together. And the type of proof is called a proof by contradiction. So suppose you want to prove that prime numbers are infinite, you assume the opposite statement is true. So you start by saying, okay, let's assume there's only finite prime numbers. And let's say that they're, for argument's sake, the first four prime numbers, right? So what's the first four prime numbers? You need to do some work for this as well to work, right? So what's the first four prime numbers? <laughs> right, we're excluding one, um, two, three, five, seven. Yeah, so 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 let's include one, but I'll you'll see why we're going to include one just in a second. Okay, so 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 let's take the first so five. Two, three, five. Yeah, sure. And if we if we multiply them all together, what do we get? Well, one times two is two times three is six times um, five is thirty times exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So, so let's go to let's go up to five. Let's go to thirty. Okay. So. Um, you would agree that that number that we've made is either a new number mm. that is non-prime or a new number that is prime. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. But we know that that number can't be prime because it's been built up as factors of every prime number on the list because we assume that there's only finitely many primes. Yeah. So this is where the trick comes in. If you then add one to get 31, yeah. this then is not divisible by any number on your list because you'll, me, you'll always have remainder one, mm -hmm. which means that there's either a prime number missing from your list where multiplied by, you know, one, two, three, five will give you 31 or 31 is a new prime number. Either way, you're a prime number short. So you've contradicted the assumption that there's only finitely many primes. And you can kind of imagine this on a larger scale up to infinity. And why I use this as an example to try to say, you know, how can I convince you that you should do a field like this is because in kind of four lines of working, you can in some way grapple with the idea of infinity. And I think that's quite a beautiful thing to be able to do and I think that's quite a powerful thing to to be able to do um so I don't know if that would convince you or not but but I think the there, maybe I think, I'm already a little biased but 
I think I think the sentiment there is that you know if you if you take something like that with prime numbers, you can actually do some very very basic arithmetic to be able to show that prime numbers are infinite. And that doesn't and, and and that doesn't actually require this comes back to public understanding, right? Or young people, that doesn't require any knowledge of mathematics. But actually the concept that prime numbers are infinite is non-trivial. You know, if you want to take a maybe more physics approach, you say, well, look at what's on in nature. Give me something in nature. And how do you describe that? Mm. You describe it fundamentally when you get down to molecular, submolecular, sub atomic, subatomic level. You describe these things by the Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation, or in terms of how these 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 kind of phenomena behave. So you know, if it, it, I think if you, I mean, my view is that if you really want to understand what goes on in reality, I mean, at the most fundamental core level. That then in some ways you cannot get away from not studying mathematics and physics to be, to be able to do that. I say that with great caution because all my experimental physics colleagues will <laughs> get me into trouble for saying that. But, but so, 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 and that's my view. And, and that's what got me into maths and, mathematics and physics was, was interest, was curiosity about how things worked, why things worked the way they did. And the exploration into the unknown. And the exploration into the unknown, yeah. Thanks so much for spending the time with me. That's been a really great discussion. I'm sure we could talk for hours, but we need to cut that off there. No, no, for sure. And uh, it's really good to, to be on the podcast, Casper. And um, take care. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. What an insightful guy. Please like, share and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.